we had four very important lectures. Good evening, friends. Uh, I, I'll give you a recap of our day two of the heart failure program we are doing for physicians. So uh, in the on day two, we had four very important lectures. We started with uh, Dr. P.P. Mohanan explaining us the importance of echocardiography in heart failure. And as he explained, Echocardiography now has a class one indication as given by the European Society of Cardiology in the assessment of the cardiac function in heart failure. It tells us about the structure, the function, and the hemodynamics. And as we all know, it, it gives us a very defined idea about how the phenotypic identification is. And based on that, we talk about heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, heart failure with a mid-range ejection fraction reduction, and a HEF-PEF. Primarily, echocardiography, as Dr. Mohanan explained, makes us look at the myocardial systolic and the diastolic function of the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Dr. Mohanan showed us some very elegant pictures and explained us that to start with, we need to look at the left ventricular uh, size, the function, the left atrial mass, and also pay attention to what we commonly call as the functional mitral regurgitation that occurs often in heart failure. He also touched on the importance of 3D echocardiography. 3D echocardiography has the best validation with uh, the cardiac MR. It gives us an idea about the left ventricular volumes in, in a very elegant way. Normally, we all use the eyeballing methodology when we look at the cardiac function. And therefore, as physicians, we also tend to look at the variation in reports given by various echo labs. As Dr. Mohanan explained, there can be 8 to 10 percent uh, variability when you use this methodology. And therefore, you have this little change in the EF. The biplane Simpson is a better method and is much more accurate, even much more accurate than the Tekos method, because you are not able to always have a good endocardial delineation. Dr. Mohanan also explained about the utility of contrast echo about uh, the utility of 3D echo, keeping the left ventricular mass index uh, cutoff levels for men and women. So in men, it's more than 115 gram per square meter of the body surface, and in women, 95 grams uh, per square meter of the body surface. He then explained that even on a conventional echo, one may want to look at the global longitudinal strain and uh, global longitudinal strain and uh, uh, look at how you can differentiate between the between the between the dilated cardiomyopathy and the ischemic cardiomyopathy one may use the longitudinal strain or circumstantial strain and also a, a radial strain but the simplest way is to look at the gls right we have a completely new uh, sort of subset which is getting popular in our country and that's cardiac oncology. Echocardiography is of a great importance in looking at whether the cardiac function is changing and the EF is changing after cancer chemotherapy. So if the GLS does not reduce less than eight, uh, does not reduce more than eight percent, then it tells you that there is no subclinical dysfunction. Anything more than 15 percent should be considered important. Lastly, Dr. Mohan explained about uh, the HEF-PEF set, the diastolic uh, dysfunction patients. And one important message he said is that uh, even on a conventional echo, it's good to look at the pulmonary vein 
put a cursor there look at the diastolic dominant pulmonary venous filling pattern the pseudo normalization pattern and that helps us understand how we look at this uh, uh, class of patients with fpl then we started with the second lecture of metabolism in heart failure by professor gisa prasano uh, gisa prasano the esc president talked about how do you look at metabolism in heart failure he touched on various fundamentals and explained one important thing that at rest the myocardium utilizes almost 60% of the free fatty acids and 40% of the glucose but when the demand becomes excessive the glucose changes to 70% and the free fatty acid to 30% so in a heart failure there is a increase free fatty acid oxidation that's something important to remember he also showed us a couple of very elegant slides on on the uh, mitochondria in failing uh, myocardium the mitochondria becomes more rounded loses its linear uh, uh, pattern and that's very suggestive of inefficient atp production he talked about four therapies that can probably alter the metabolism in heart failure first was trimetazidine the effect of trimetazidine on cardiac energy production what cardi what uh, trimetazidine does is it reduces the left ventricular end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume in both idiopathic and ischemic dilated cardiomyopathies it also reduces the bnp levels the cardiac biomarkers in this study that he showed us the second drug is a new drug it's it's still in the phase 3 trial it's called bendavia and here is a drug that improves the myocardial structure and function bendavia will increase the atp production and therefore give a more energy efficiency to a failing myocardium the third drug he touched upon is the importance of fcm ferric carboxymaltose in uh, uh, in iron deficiency in heart failure uh, so fcm also increases the atp we have two major trials that came up here confirm heart failure and we had affirm heart failure so both of them showed a, a good result and lastly uh, the fourth drug was of course we all know that dapagliflozin which was used in uh, dapahf trial uh, in the recent times SGLT2 inhibitors alter the mitochondrial function and makes a difference on the on the way the failing heart can derive a more ATP production. Then the third talk came up from Professor Venu Gopal, who covered CMR and cardiac CT, and he started with explaining us the protocols. We all know them, and in in a failing heart, you still need to look at the T1 weighted uh, images. and the chamber volumes can be assessed by the ssfp protocol that's the steady state uh, fractional precision protocols gadolinium enhancement for the fundamental understanding of all physicians is very important so when when in a normal heart uh, the the contrast bolus of gadolinium will have a wash in wash out phase so this just doesn't linger around right but if you start getting a signal enhancement about 5 minutes after the initial contrast bolus that's the late gadolinium enhancement and it's so very important in in the whole methodology of cmr uh, uh, utility in heart failure depending upon how the enhancement occurs dr venu gopal showed us uh, pictures of subendocardial mid wall and epicardial enhancement the subendocardial are commonly seen in ischemic heart disease and amyloid the mid wall are commonly seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and sarcoid the epicardial are often seen in sarcoid mr has a much better efficacy than echocardiography in 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 terms of assessing not just the size the volumes of the heart but also assessing the left ventricular and right ventricular function then uh, professor venugopal spoke to us on uh, the utility of cardiac ct 
Now, cardiac CT, besides the assessment of myo and pericardium and looking at the aorta, may have a, a little limited role in, in the setting of a decompensated heart failure or acute heart failure, and maybe even a little chronic heart failure where the EF is down, because you're concerned even now uh, with the contrast that is injected, good cardiac CT labs uh, uh, can do still a good CT at about anywhere between 50 to 70 ml of contrast, but that's also a little higher than the conventional cardiac CT. The importance probably will come as the discussion that followed up uh, with Dr. V.K. Chopra and Dr. Bhagirath, Hari Krishnan, Shastri, is that uh, the calcium score can help you at least identify whether they are underlying atherosclerotic plaques. The only good message is if a patient has a zero calcium score, that's good news. Any calcium which is seen is not innocuous. It does indicate atherosclerotic plaques, calcified ones can have associated softer plaques. So SCCT as a guideline in 2021, which I will suggest all of you refer to, and uh, a score which exceeds 400 may require a physiological assessment to know whether these are all ischemia producing plaques or these are just something which are more of adventitial calcium. And lastly, we had the very elegant case presentations by Professor Nasiman. The first case was of a 63 years old gentleman with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and uh, came with cardiac failure, EF 45%, treated with optimal medical treatment on device. Then after three years, he again came back with two episodes of heart failure. The EF fell to 35%. And then as he showed, how a biventricular pacing helped this patient and uh, along with optimal medical therapy and reduction of cordron, just beta blocker had. It was the second case I thought which should be of great relevance to physicians. He talked about a 58 years old gentleman and Narsimhan is absolute expertise on this subject. Uh, NYHA class three, severe systolic dysfunction with a EF of 27%, lab bundle branch block, a uh, QRS duration more than 130 millisecond. Typically, one starts looking at this patient, a very sick patient, and probably candidates for a device or for a enrollment for a heart transplant in the longer runs once medical therapy doesn't suit the purpose. But what he highlighted, and this is one of the best messages from a master teacher, is that uh, they did a cardiac pet. The pet picked up a lymph node in the neck and on histopathology, it was a granulomatous node, so it was a sarcoid. They treated him with uh, a course of methylprednisolone and a, a, uh, a course of uh, methotrexate. The patient did well for a while, but um, landed up again after one year. I mean, the EF almost normalized. It just went from 27 to near normal. And then he came back with a severe LV dysfunction because of reactivation of pulmonary sarcoid. That's the time his methotrexate was reduced and stopped. And then he explained that the pulses of cyclophosphamide helped these patients. And over a period of time, he could reduce the dose of methotrexate and continue with cyclophosphamide and patient did very well. The bottom line message of this case was, you can get a patient of refractory heart failure with left bundle branch block, and this can be an early presentation of cardiac sarcoid. Therefore, we talk about then, which is better, cardiac MR or cardiac PET, or both together. The first stop is always cardiac MR in most of these centers in cities because cardiac PET is not easily available. Even cardiac MR is not that very commonly done at all uh, districts and towns of India. But what he explained was this, that cardiac PET will help you identify the site from which you do the biopsy. So that's one. Two, a cardiac PET will let us know where is the inflammation? How much is the inflammation? 
if there is an inflammation, then it is responsive uh, to the immunosuppression therapy and pulse doses of cyclophosphamide. If there is less of an inflammation and more of a scar, then it's very unlikely that these patients will continue to do with the immunosuppression and therefore they should be listed for transplant. So the active inflammation or the burn status can be picked up on cardiac uh, PET. We must remember, as I explained, that about 20% of the patients of cardiac sarcoid are resistant to methotrexate and steroids. And therefore, it's very relevant and very important to do a cardiac PET when you suspect inflammation. The way forward would be probably if you do a PET MRI, but that's not very common in this country. We had a phenomenal discussion that followed all these four um, lectures with our panel and uh, we had a great day for day two and I'm looking forward to our lectures for the day three. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dai. Uh, that was an excellent recap of the uh, previous day's meeting. Dr. Bagirat, uh, would you like to add your yes. comment? Yes. Uh, thanks, Dr. Uday. That was really comprehensive and covered uh, uh, every aspect of uh, what was spoken in the evaluation and management of heart failure in the week that just went by. Uh, today's theme is uh, management of heart failure. Uh, we have four exciting uh, talks and very eminent speakers lined up for this August audience. And to take you through today's proceedings, we have Dr. Jay Gopal and Dr. Santanu Sengupta. So over to both of you to moderate today's session. Thank you, Dr. Bhagirath. I think without uh, wasting much time, we'll go to the talks straight away. Uh, we were informed that Dr. Coates would join a little later. So I think, um, can we have the first talk by Dr. Jay Z Mohan? Uh, is that the order that we're going? So we are playing the recording. Sir. Can I start, sir? Yeah, please, please. Okay, sir. We are starting, sir. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. We would be talking about a patient with stabilized HFREF discharge planning initiation and titration of disease modifying agents. Data from Trivendram heart failure registry has shown that one-year mortality post-discharge is about 31% and readmission rates are about 30%. And even then, guideline-directed medical therapy at discharge is described to only 25% of the patients. Recent data from the Valor Heart Failure Registry, that is acute decompensated heart failure registry, shows that six-month rehospitalization rate is 42% and six-month death rates are 38%. Horrendous figures which suggest that we need to do something to these post ADHF patients. A similar kind of data is available from the Western world, and this is looking at the Victoria trial, where, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the trial essentially was a post ADHF patient, high risk individual, very what was used. What is important is that at 10 months in these 5,000 patients, whole cause mortality was 17% and total rehospitalization was 43% at 10 months, clearly indicating that stabilized HFREF patient is actually a high-risk phenotype. And in the, the uh, vulnerable period actually is the first few weeks or four, uh, few months after discharge. And that is the, during, this is the period during which we need to start comprehensive guideline-directed disease-modifying therapy as quickly as possible, as comprehensive as possible, including all the agents which can change the prognosis of these patients. Keep in mind one thing that mortality risk is twice as high during first 30 days compared to six months after discharge. Hence, the emphasis has to be initiating disease-modifying therapy as soon as possible. The same thing is true for sudden cardiac death post-discharge. The risk first one month nearly five times compared to a person who has never been hospitalized. And hence, 
there is also a need to consider device therapy seriously in these individuals, especially those who had previous HFRF and have been admitted because of decompensation. Data from Trivindram Heart Failure Registry again suggests that hospitalization for heart failure triples the risk of mortality. So a person who has been once admitted or decompensated heart failure is a high risk phenotype anyway. And six month mortality actually is pretty high after one, month, one admission and it becomes nearly 50% after fourth admission. Why there is bad prognosis after discharge in these stabilized HFRI patients? Because there is enhanced neurohumoral activation, effect of cytokine storm. It is usually preceded by lack of adherence or underuse of guideline directed medical therapy. Discontinuation of guideline directed medical therapy during hospitalization and at discharge, underuse of guideline directed medical therapy as you saw in the Vindram Heart Failure Registry. And of course, non-escalation of therapy post-discharge. We don't go to the maximum tolerated doses. We don't give all the four or five class of drugs which are necessary. What should be the checklist at discharge? That we have addressed the exacerbating or precipitating factors adequately, which could be infection, ischemia, rhythm issues that the IV medications have been discontinued, that the optimal volume status has been achieved. Well, you can see that by lung scan, IV, you know, the inferior vena cava or clinical examination or weight, and that there is no orthostatic hypotension in the individual, there is no inappropriate tachycardia. Patients, a patient and his family has been well educated about all aspects of heart failure. Optimal pharmacological therapy has been initiated at discharge or there is a definite plan how to initiate it in case it is not optimal at the moment. And of course, stable renal function and electrolytes have been achieved. We need to keep in mind one thing that there are five male adaptive biological targets which need to be aimed at simultaneously or in quick succession. And these are angiotensin II, aldosterone, norepinephrine, and of course, I'll include heart rate there and vasoactive peptides and of course, new kid on the block, that is energy substrate. And the best practice is to target all of these pathways. Why we need to target all these pathways? Data, for, recent data suggests that the uh, old cause mortality, the fire NNP actually is the lowest if you use uh, uh, beta blockers, uh, SGL2 inhibitor like dapagliflozin, and of course, ARNI, followed by MRA, and then, of course, there is a role of uh, devices. So what is important here are beta blockers, ARMI, SGL2 inhibitors, and MRA. Targeting all relevant pathways is more important than achieving higher doses of one and ignoring other drugs. And clinicians face the challenge of simultaneously using several drugs, achieving target doses, and managing side effects that are often overlapping like hyperkalemia or worsening of the renal function. However, focus in stabilized acute decompensated heart failure continues to be reduce short-term high mortality, reduce rehospitalization, and improve quality of life. So what can we do? Our goals are discharge with optimal hemodynamics, as I discussed, initiate guideline directed medical therapy as soon as possible, up titrate therapy as soon as possible, within four weeks, if possible, if not within eight to 10 weeks, co-manage comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, renal dysfunction, anemia, vaccinate and discharge and consider device therapy with the previous history of FF. Having said that, that seems to be lofty aim because implementation science lags behind discovery science. And science cannot be practiced in empty space. So there are gaps in our practice and the reason is patients and physicians have their own tolerance, preferences, prejudices, and payment issues. However, this is some data which we published last year about acute decompensated heart failure or stabilized FRA patients of 428 patients showing that at discharge, you can achieve, if it is a cardiology-based practice, and if you are a really uh, what you call yourself as a heart failure specialist, 
you can finally achieve to give anti ras agents in, the, in the, over half the patient beta blocker in over half the patients mr in one third of the patients and rn in 21% and about a quarter of patient will get evil red this is not optimal but this is what physicians normally uh, do it because of their fears their prejudices uh, and of course looking at the overall risk score of these patients so what are the issues beside inertia and hesitancy let us believe that we physicians should not have inertia and hesitancy borderline blood pressure renal function and waiting for more hemodynamic stability are the issues which do not allow us to initiate optimal guideline directed disease modifying therapy so the earliest post discharge visit has to be less than 7 days and this is the time when you have to assess the patient's a uh, response the drug tolerance add new drugs look at the precipitating and amplifying factor so the first thing which we have to do is get a very quick visit after 3 4 days 5 days certainly before 7 days to assess many factors which are needed for long term optimal management of stabilized fever patients some some important uh, caveats are that switching agents within a drug class may also improve tolerance to guideline directed medical therapy people who don't tolerate army may tolerate small dose of ac inhibitor that is very interesting thing people who do not tolerate spironolactone may tolerate small dose of larinol and this is another interesting aspect splitting dosing regimen over a 24 hour period and avoiding intake of all vasoactive medications at once may limit blood pressure swings so this is another thing which we can do even though many of us believe in giving uh, drugs um, in one go uh, you could split the doses and this could help these patients in better tolerance so coming to the rd which is the first drug which has been suggested by the guidelines to be initiated in stabilized hefra patient that would cover the vulnerable period and we have data both from paradigm and pioneer hf to indicate that you can cut down the mortality by 20% and the pioneer hf although the the primary endpoint was anti probnp which is a surrogate for better prognosis but even the secondary endpoints of death hospital for heart failure lv use and listing of transplant were reduced by nearly 34% by early initiation of army in the early initiation of army is possible in vast majority of patients as shown in transition study whether you start pre discharge or post discharge some amount of army can be patient can be on nearly 90% of the time at the end of 10 weeks and at least what i would call as median to optimal dose can be given to two third of the patients actually by 10 weeks and this is a very encouraging thing which tells us that we must uh, uh shun from hesitancy and inertia and try to give army multiple ways of making patient Uh, tolerate army are available and you can start with smaller doses you could start you may not start the blood pressure lowering drugs other blood pressure lowering drugs initially so on and so forth or you could cut down the use of diuretics so the 2019 heart failure consensus statement by esc says that initiation of army rather than as inhibitor arb may be considered a new onset heart failure or adhf to reduce the risk there is no doubt that beta blocker should be started as early as possible the the current uh, doc mcmurray and, and milton packer's uh, paper also suggests that beta blocker should be at the top of our mind because they are the most effective drug to reduce all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality here the data from the optimize hf registry showing that those who were given carvedilol uh, within the first um, uh, month actually they had a 60 to 90 days uh, mortality which was nearly 50% less and those who are not given carvedilol remember in this study also only 50% people were given carvedilol within the first few months and the rest weren't given and so same i showed you in the study which we published that 54% patients were beta blocker clearly we have to increase the number of patients who can be on beta blocker at the time of discharge or immediately after discharge and in case you can't give beta blockers and the heart rate is above 70 The second choice is, of course, evabradin. Evabradin can be added to small doses of beta blockers, or may be given alone in case beta blockers are not tolerated. Because the data suggests that the 30-day discharge, a hospital 
uh, hospitalization reduced by nearly 30 percent by use of EVA bed. Actually, uh, we uh, in India have uh, conducted a study which is under under publication. It's called core study. It's a multi-centric HFRC post agent registry in which we found that at discharge our patient had a heart rate of 93 despite two thirds being on beta blockers. And we added EVA bedding to 93% of them. We were able to bring down the rate to 75%, 75 at one month, indicating that, that even though you have given beta blockers, which you think patient can tolerate, adding EVA bedding will certainly bring down the rate. And data suggests that bringing down the rate actually is going to be beneficial to these patients. Most of that data and acute decompensate heart failure not available. We are trying to extrapolate from shift trial. However, there is a trial going on called Prime HF, which is uh, in USA, which is pre-discharge initiation of your bad in management of heart failure. And as of now, the results are not available. This is pioneered by the Duke Research Institute. Giving MRA as quickly as possible is another thing which you should consider seriously, either pre-discharge or immediately after discharge. And our study showed that in at least one third of the patient MRA can be given pre-discharge and rest you should try to, in any case, the, you finally will end up, uh, end up giving MRA to nearly 70% patient, not more than that because of caveats and contraindications. But this data by Ella Mazel called COACH study, a very interesting study, a randomized study has shown that if you give spironolactone at discharge or don't give spironolactone at discharge in a randomized fashion, 30 day results show a 45% reduction in primary endpoint of death and hospitalization for heart failure just by adding spironolactone therapy. And this is a very impressive data. However, the patients who are never on spironolactone show a much greater 68% reduction in death and hospital life for heart failure. Small study, but powerful information, powerful message that you must start MRA as quickly as possible in stabilized FRA patients. The next agents are, of course, SGL2 inhibitors. The best trial one can think of in a stabilized FRA patient is SOLACE WHF trial. And although a small trial, uh, abruptly terminated, but clearly giving soda glyphosate in these patients reduced the primary endpoints of death and hospital for heart failure by 33%. There was, a, there was a decrease in cardiovascular disease and there was a significant reduction in hospitalization of heart failure. The SGL2 inhibitors have been tried in other randomized trials. We have data from DEPA-HF, Emperor Reduce, and Soloist. All have indicated one thing, that you can significantly reduce the primary endpoints of cardiovascular death and hospitalized for heart failure. And this is another agent which should be started as quickly as possible. In Soloist WHF, this was started pre-discharge or within three days of discharge, exactly what we are trying to propose to you. Why is that you have to give dapagliflozin or, or other SGL2 inhibitor as quickly as possible after stabilization? You should see the last line, it says, patients who have been hospitalized in the last 12 months get the maximum benefit of SGL2 inhibitors. Number needed to treat are just 10 compared to number needed to treat 44 in those who have never been hospitalized. So a hospitalized patient is a high risk phenotype, likely to get four times greater benefit with dapagliflozin compared to those who have never been hospitalized. Again, looking at these three trials, which is Dapa, Emperor, Reduce, and Soloist, you would need that there you still see that annualized absolute risk reduction maximum in patients who have been given pre-discharge or immediately after discharge, as in Soleil study, and number needed to treat is 16, which is very, very impressive. In a similar way, if you look at the five years NNT in patients who had a stabilized heart failure, as in Soleil's WHO study, very impressive data. Four patients are treated for five years to prevent one absolute reduction primary endpoint. Not that the other drugs are not effective. The other drugs are equally effective, but these are individual, these um, these trials are of less sicker patients. Benefit of the SGL2 inhibitors come much early. The data from the uh, Emperor Reduce says that the the, uh, the benefits come up within 17 days. Significant benefit come within 17 days, and data from DAPA HF studies says that significant benefit in DAPA HF come up within within 28 days. So within few days and weeks, you can see remarkable positive benefit of SGL2 inhibitors in patients who have been stabilized with heart failure. 
The dilemma is how to sequence and, and dose these uh, various classes of drugs. Now that we have talked about all classes of drugs, the ACCHA F HFSA consensus 2021 suggests that after you have stabilized the patient, you should start with anti-RAS and beta blockers in any order you prefer. Prefer army or ACE inhibitor and use diuretics for decongestion, which we haven't talked. Of course, diuretics are not the disease modifying agents and you can use them depending on the requirement. Clinical congestion should be the criteria. Sometimes people can use subclinical congestion also as a criteria. Then the, these guidelines say that after you have given to the maximal tolerated dose of anti ras agents and beta blockers, you can go on to aldosterone antagonists and SGL2 inhibitors. This is one way of looking at the thing. And, uh, and this is an empiric sequence with uh, no validation. However, John McMurray and uh, Milton Packer actually three months back proposed a new sequencing shown on the right side. It says in step one at discharge, give beta blockers and SGL2 inhibitors straight away. And the next visit, try to add the army. And of course, next visit, you have to add MRA. All these three steps should be achieved within four weeks and up titration to target doses thereafter. So what it says, the initiation should be within the four weeks and up titration could take another four to six weeks. And that seems to be a very logical thing when you look at the entire benefit of SGL2 inhibitors and beta blockers. Why is the first step beta blockers and SGL2 inhibitors? Because the fire NNT for alcohol mortality are very impressive, both for beta blockers and SGL2 inhibitors, eight and 10%, least side effects of the combination least monitoring required and no biochemical alterations. And data uh, suggests that in case you use SGL2 inhibitors, uh, beta blockers, mRNA, or in all four drugs, you can cut down the cardiovascular death and all cause mortality by 50% over and above conventional guideline directed medical therapy, which is using anti-RAS agents in beta alone, as was uh, the case in most patients in the heart failure history. And you can add even free survival in younger people by about eight years and in older people by about six years if you use comprehensive guideline directed medical therapy, which includes all the four class of agents which I talked about. So, to summarize, uh, ladies and gentlemen, early initiation of titration of army, SGL2 inhibitor, beta blocker, MRI is feasible, safe, well tolerated. Within four weeks, patients should be on board of all these drugs. In the next four weeks, you should. So to summarize, when you make a choice, you change the future of your patient. Thank you very much. Sir? So we Thank have you, Dr. Mohan, for a, for a very exhaustive and wonderful presentation. I think the message is very loud and clear. Once you have a patient with a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, I think the way to go about is early initiation of the guideline-based medical therapy. Now, it's heartening to note that, you know, in fact, you showed in some of your slides that uh, beta blockers usage is definitely increased. And that's what we have seen out from the larger registries also. Close to about 60-65% of the patients are on beta blockers at discharge, though the use of A's in ARB is considerably low, close to 40%. Uh, but do you think this, uh, uh, in, in, the, in a country like India, the, uh, it would become, a, the army would become the first choice rather than an A's in ARB? I think they would, the, as soon as um, these come out of the patent, which is likely to happen, and soon, and of course, some people will jump the gun and bring it even earlier than the 10 year embargo. So I think in next, uh, I, I would guess next five years, certainly they will become number one. They would replace as an inhibitor and ARB, definitely. The cost will come down significant the moment they go out of the embargo. Uh, so, other question is about, uh, in fact, uh, about Milton Packer and um, uh, McMurray showed me their new sequencing is that, you know, you don't really worry about the side effects like hyperkalemia and so on when you start with a beta blocker and, and it's also a fixed dose. You know, for example, SGL2 is just one single dose. You don't need to uptritate, which is actually an advantage when you, when you start treating. But I think the one, one important thing which I, which meant something little, little, uh, let's say, uh, uh, difficult thing to understand in at least the Indian scenarios is a much higher usage of ibuprofen much before the beta blockers. 
many physicians are fond of starting them on ibuprofen much before the beta blockers which is not to be not to be encouraged at all i think it, it, it this is something which we have seen in some of our registries i think so this is something to be really uh, i mean uh, talked about uh, dr jagopal that is right but when we look at the published data i uh, we have published uh, two different series and two different um, uh time frames one in 2013 14 and another just the last year the evabradin use in 2013 14 was 27% and the current study has 21% i think the the asian heart failure registry has about 14% use of evabradin so we are not too far we are slightly more than the rest of the asia but i think the number probably in europe and maybe andrews can tell us would be the same about 14 15 20% it shouldn't be more than that so we are not unusually bothered but as a bridge actually maybe evabradin works in good uh, frail people with hemodynamic instability i probably will use it as a bridge far more than of course for a long term use in every patient professor coach yes yeah i agree i don't think it's a problem of having a use of evabradin the issue is if it's used as an excuse not to use a beta blocker that's a problem but if it's used as part of guideline directed medical therapy on top of a beta blocker in people with persistent tachycardia it's a very good thing um, so i'm happy to have a higher rate there so i was uh, listening to dr swedberg who was one of the pioneers of beta blocker therapy and he said that when they analyzed when they did a repeat analysis of beta blocker trials it was not the dose of beta blocker which made the difference but the heart rate which was achieved so mm. there is a case you know if you bring down the heart rate significantly there are so many beneficial effects which occur and there are situations uh, in clinical cardiology where straight away using beta blockers at times is a bit of a problem and there is a persistent sinus tachycardia so in those situations i think it may be off label but many of us use start off with the evabradin and as things stabilize then introduce beta blockers i mean of course nothing takes away from the importance of beta blockers they have to be there but it is just the sequence and the combination which one has to figure out yeah. i was part of that group and there was a is very controversial i think about two thirds of us were very happy to say the data suggested that target heart rate is the most important thing but there was one particularly powerful figure who vehemently opposed that um, and it wasn't Carl Svedberg so dr mohan uh, a very important question uh, so what beta blocker do you uh, usually start it, this for the physicians carvidlol bisoprolol vitriprolol so i use all three actually but i would tell you one thing personal experience if there is a issue of orthostatic hypotension i don't use carvidlol we are aware of comet trial we we are aware that the the acc uh, esc uh, guidelines say you can use metoprolol uh, succinate uh, bisoprolol and carvedilol any of the three and they have a roughly same 34 35% reduction in mortality and of course the the europeans do recommend nebivalol which the americans don't recommend and that is where andrews can make a comment but the fact remains i i use a lot of bisoprolol for one simple reason i don't see much of the hypotension carvedilol i do see some degree of less reduction in heart rate although surprisingly in comet trial carvedilol did much better than metoprolol heart rate and so those are issues in our, my own practice i i use a lot of metoprolol succinate and i go up to 200 mg quite often but uh, i i am much more comfortable with bisoprolol but that doesn't say that i don't use a uh, carvedilol i probably use one third one third one third yeah i might i might make a comment um, i actually presented to the fda on behalf of forest to get a license for the bisoprolol in the us and there are two rules congress laws that prevented it one is that they cannot approve a drug um, with a single trial unless there's a class effect and because bucindolol did not work they couldn't approve nebivolol and the us guidelines cannot recommend a drug that's not available for use in the united states so they cannot recommend nebivolol despite the fact that it does have a role and it's very useful in in older patients there's no doubt about it so andrew how do you choose a beta blocker i tend to use rather like the trials if i get a severe heart failure in a young person with low ejection fraction then i'd use carvedilol first if i see an elderly patient 
frail, um, perhaps with uh, erectile dysfunction, then I'd use Bivolol, definitely. So it's more the profiling of the patients. If you're worried about low blood pressure, you might not want a vasodilating beta blocker. I use all four in different, different circumstances. Arbitrilol also has some alpha blocker effect, so that way its hypotensive yes. effect is a little bit more than the others. Yeah, so low, low blood pressure, I think, would steer you away from carvedilol. Um, and if you've got peripheral vascular disease, you might want to use specifically uh, nabivalol or carvedilol. But for elderly male patients with heart failure, I like nabivalol. And so at the moment, uh, with the uh, DARPA trials coming up, we are seeing a lot of uh, uh, physicians uh, suddenly starting using a lot of DARPA, uh, but they don't use the targeted therapy which is needed. Uh, your thoughts, I mean, how to go about it? No, the, the, I think they have a glyphosate or for that matter, AMPA glyphosate and great drugs. And we, as we discussed and as the, that editorial or the review article says, you don't have to titrate anything. Just 10 milligram of both these drugs is good enough actually in every patient heart failure, diabetes or no diabetes. Of course, the side effects are much less hypoglycemia in non-diabetics. And of course, the, 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 I, I, I saw a, a review actually, uh, no, it was meta-analysis by Javed Butler in December ESC heart failure uh, journal. We say that actually the adverse effects of uh, DAPA, of uh, SGLT inhibitors are less than placebo actually, which is interesting, which is very interesting in heart failure. And I, I, I tend to believe it. I haven't seen anything significant happening to my patient. And I, at the moment, is using in every single person uh, both DAPA, um, DAPA and or empagliflozin. Yeah, this is from the patient's perspective. You have a patient with heart failure, which reduced ejection fraction, put them on medications, they do very well and they recover. And at some point of time, do you feel like de-escalating the therapy or would you, would you uh, continue the same dosage of medications? So we, we have the guidelines. Guidelines are against de-escalation. You could do, I mean, guidelines are certainly against stoppage. The de-escalation may be on a case-to-case -case basis, but we have, we have some sketchy data. We have TRED HF uh, randomized study, which has shown recurrence in 45% patient within six months and the ejection fraction going down by um, uh, as much as 10% mm -hmm. moment you stop the guideline directed medical therapy. As of now, as of now, the data suggests that you shouldn't be stopping these drugs you might tweak with the uh, doses a little bit here and there, but by and large, you should continue with all guideline-directed medical therapy in patients with heart failure with improved ejection fraction. And the, and the, and the interesting actually, and, and, and in the beginning of this month, beginning of last month, actually, the HFSA came up with the universal definition of heart failure. So there is a fourth category, heart failure with improved ejection fraction. And the, the, the guidelines do suggest that you continue the guideline-directed medical therapy. So I think uh, 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 there's a question, uh, which SGLT2 should be preferred, I think, uh, in, in heart failure? That's one of the questions which is coming in the audience. So the data actually, even from Vertis CV data and other shares, it is a classified. You can use anything. It doesn't make a difference. I mean, I, I, I'm not being paid by any company, so I can tell you this thing very clearly. Uh, you can use anything. Vertis CV also had a 30% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. DAPA does the same thing. Even remoglifluzin, which is cheap and available in India, will do the same thing. I'm pretty sure of that. Dr. Andrew, you have Thank you, sir. Uh, we are yeah. running out of time. Can we have uh, Dr. Chopra, can you introduce uh, Professor Coates to... Well, it's an absolute pleasure to once again welcome Dr. Coates. He's an old friend of Heart Failure Association. He's been with us a number of times and he's the current president of the Heart Failure Association of European Society of Cardiology. It's always a pleasure to listen to him. His messages are very clear, very succinct. So Dr. Coates, all yours, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be with you um, in this joint um, course uh, for heart failure physicians. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Are you seeing full screen? Yes, sir. We can yep. start. Okay. Going to right to the wrong end. 
if you're very quick, you would have seen it all. So I would like to talk about devices for heart failure, which is the flip side of drug treatments. Now, it's interesting that patients often prefer a device because drug treatments, they're reminded of it every day, whereas a device they feel they take the discomfort, they take a modest risk, and then they get long-term benefit. Um, but there have been substantial advances. Now, we know in established guidelines, there are two major devices that are well-established, and that is ICDs. Um, pivotal clinical trials have shown the benefit in certain circumstances in secondary and primary prevention of sudden arrhythmic cardiac death, but often measured by total cardiovascular mortality. So we get guidelines that are fairly consistent there. You see class 1A recommendations for secondary prevention, survivors of VF cardiac arrest. We have primary prevention recommendations, some very strong 1A for ejection fraction below 35% uh, on optimal medical therapy or ischemic etiology. The recommendation for non-ischemic etiology is not so strong because of the Danish study suggesting that they couldn't prove a benefit. And of course, it's not to be used within 40 days of a myocardial infarction because we saw no benefit in that circumstance. The other, of course, major device was the cardiac resynchronization therapy in heart failure, where a number of trials going back many years now have shown substantial improvements in clinical outcomes so that we also get a fair consistency between major guidelines in terms of the use of CRT. These recommendations have become sharpened up. We've got more clarity now. The QRS duration greater than 150 in the presence of left bundle branch block is a strong class 1A recommendation for the treatment of heart failure. Um, if the QRS duration between 130 and 150 is slightly less strong, and if the QRS duration is less than 130, it should not be used. That's, of course, because of the adverse outcomes found in the ECHO CRT trial. The recommendations are slightly softer in patients with a non-left bundle branch pattern because most of the trials included left bundle branch block and the benefits are more clearly evident in patients with left bundle branch block. So the only recent improvement in this field is that of the recognition of the lower limit for QRS to recommend CRT. Of course, there are other devices that are not therapeutic directly, but are indirectly. And of course, the CardioMEMS, implantable pulmonary artery pressure monitoring system, can be placed in there. Um, the patient can then interrogate the device that can be shipped to the center and you can get measurements of pulmonary artery pressures. And when the doctor gets access to these fluctuations in pulmonary artery pressures, it can lead to changes in medication that can then translate to a reduction in mortality and heart failure hospitalization. Most of the altered medication doses are diuretic doses, but a few are increasing guideline directed medical therapy, particularly the vasodilator classes. And this, the CHAMPION trial, showed the significant effect on composite outcomes um, and particularly heart failure hospitalization for the cardio MEMS device. And interestingly, this was a crossover study, and those patients who had been randomized control were then placed onto the device they got a further reduction in heart failure hospitalization. So clearly there is a benefit. The issue comes as to whether this benefit is equal depending on the healthcare system, because you have to have the capacity to respond to the pulmonary artery pressure monitoring. There's no point in monitoring it if you don't have a way to respond to changes in PA pressures and optimize guideline directed medical therapy. When we take a look forward now, of course, we've heard about the new treatments, SGLT2 inhibitors, sucubitol valsartan, other new agents on the horizon, intravenous iron, very ciguat, omicaptive, macabal, of which we have some increasing evidence, but also there's a lot happening in the device field, new devices, mitroclip and carolin devices for functional or secondary mitral regurgitation, reshaping devices, neurostimulation, and atrial septal decongestion as well as te telemedical devices. I won't have a chance to go through all of those, but give you some idea. One very interesting device is cardiac contractility modulation, which is a pacemaker-like device inserted into two places in the heart, but it gives stimulation to the cardiac muscle, not to cause a, a depolarization, but it's given during the absolute refractory period. And this stimulation, electrical stimulation, increases the strength of cardiac contractility without gen generating an extra heartbeat. 
It also causes biological effects and gene expression at a distance from the stimulation site. Um, it is an implantable device that's very similar to a pacemaker. The mode of action is shown there. And for isolated human trabeculae, uh, myocytes, we see that rapid, very early within seconds, increase in cardiac contractility and placed in the chest is a rather like a conventional pacemaker device. We performed an individual patient data meta-analysis some years ago now and showed that of all the randomized trials of this device, and of course with a single manufacturer, we know that we can get every patient, we saw a significant increase in peak VO2 of 0.8 mils per kilogram per minute, an increase in six minute corridor walk test, and an improvement in the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure Questionnaire. Subsequently, there was what's called the FIX HF5C confirmatory study, and that was granted expedited access pathway designation by the FDA. It randomized 160 patients at US and EU sites, patients with ejection fractions between 25 and 45%, because previous studies suggested the benefits were greater when there's some relative preservation of left ventricular function, with a primary efficacy endpoint being increase in peak VO2. What was found was a significant benefit. This was a Bayesian trial, a Bayesian analysis. So there's only a single arm shown here, but it is statistically still as powerful as a randomized control trial. And that showed an increase of 0.84 uh, of peak VO2 at 24 weeks. So that's a, had approval in the US and it's a useful extra efficacy for patients improving quality of life and functional capacity, which is now subject to a large trial about to start with an even more borderline ejection fraction between 40 and 60% to see if these benefits could extend into what we'd now call heart failure with mid-range or mildly reduced ejection fraction. It was also associated with improvements in Minnesota Living with Heart Failure Questionnaire and improvement in NYHA functional class. Another very interesting series of devices are those designed to address secondary mitral regurgitation, which of course is common in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and is associated with worse clinical condition and adverse outcomes in terms of mortality and morbidity. It's very common, particularly as heart failure progresses. Now, it's an interesting field because surgical treatments had not been shown to benefit. And then there was the development of a percutaneous device, the MitraClip procedure, um, that could clip the leaflets of the prolapsing mitral valve. And two trials were conducted around about the same time. One, the Mitra FR study in France, and that showed no benefit at all with the use of MitraClip compared to standard medical therapy. But at the same time, the COAP trial with the same device, similar number of patients, showed a dramatic benefit of a 37% reduction in the composite endpoint of mortality and heart failure hospitalization. We don't really know why these two trials were different. COAP was larger. They had uh, slightly more severe mitral regurgitation. The effective regurgitant orifice area was bigger, 41 versus 31. Probably the, the reason the difference may have been that there was more severe MR but less severe heart failure. So although the ejection fraction was, was similar, the LVE end diastolic volume was 101 in coapt, it was 135 in mitra FR. So mitra FR had much bigger ventricles, but less regurgitation. Coapt had less enlarged ventricles and more severe mitra regurgitation. So the extent to which we can extrapolate between trials, it does appear the mitra clip is probably preferable when the LV is not that enlarged, but when the MR is particularly severe. The consensus recommendation we produced um, now coming about 18 months ago was that we recommended referral of patients with heart failure and secondary MR to a multidisciplinary heart failure team and the reduction in MR using the MitraClip device may be considered. We've subsequently updated this, device, uh, this advice in the European Heart Journal just only a couple of weeks ago, um, but is, we still recommend selected use of MitraClip device in certain patients, but only after very detailed evaluation. Now, this is not the only device for reduction in MR. There are many other uh, devices, um, such as Edwin's cardio band, um, the Abbott device, Mitraline, 
But I'd like to just concentrate on this one, which is a simpler, very elegant system, the Carillion mitral contour system, and it's quite different and designed to be used much earlier in progressive mitral regurgitation. It's a very small device, you see, very simple. It's inserted via transjugular delivery system. Then the device can be deployed and it expands and it gets two anchor points. And here we show it in place. So the catheter puts it into the coronary sinus. The device can then be released and it crimps, it just reduces the diameter of the left ventricle at approximately mitral valve level. So it reduces mitral regurgitation, not by actually changing the mitral valve, but by reducing the diameter of the left ventricle at mitral valve area. You there, you see you de deploy the distal anchor, you then t apply tension and release the devices, causing that to then reduce ventricular size. This leads to significant LV reverse remodeling, an improvement in the LV adverse remodeling of heart failure. And this is an interesting um, result that was done in 2010 and updated in 2019, and looks at all treatments, both devices and drugs, and relates beneficial effects on mortality with changes in end diastolic volume. And you see there's a very good correlation between the ability to reduce end diastolic volume in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and the ability to reduce mortality, suggesting this reduction in ventricular volumes may be a very useful mechanism of improved benefits. And when we look at this Carillion device, which unlike the mitral clip isn't directly attaching the valve leaflets, but it's attacking the ventricular ring, you see that you do get a progressive reduction in diastolic volume as shown there. And it was highly significant in the only uh, randomized double blind trial of MR reduction. And we see this change in LV EDV at one year in the reduce FMR, that's the name of the trial, severe MR group, whereas in COAP and MITRA FR, there is a difference, particularly in COAP, but it's not a reduction in L LV and diastolic volume in the intervened patients, it's just there is a greater enlargement in the placebo patients. So in comparison, in contrast to the MITRA clip, the Carillion device actually reduces end diastolic volume. <clears throat> it has not been subject to the large trials, so we can't at the moment make definitive comments about mortality and hospitalization, but at least there is an encouraging trend that in the, um, the, the trial of the Carillion device, there was a significant reduction in total heart failure hospitalizations, but of course it was underpowered to say that definitively. Clinical outcomes by at 12 months in an individual patient meta-analysis we've done also showed improvements in KCCQ and a trend to a reduction in terminal pro-BNP. Another device I'm putting into the heart failure device section is actually not a heart failure device itself. It's a device for central sleep apnea, and that's the Remedy system. It's also an implantable electrical device, but it's, it's aimed to stimulate the phrenic nerve by going in the left costophrenic vein, um, and that can then stimulate the phrenic nerve to cause diaphragmatic stimulation, which prevents oscillatory breathing of central sleep apnea, which of course is quite common in heart failure. You see when the device is switched on, this oscillatory chain stokes respiration immediately disappears. That can smooth out respiratory patterns during sleep. That's associated with highly significant reductions in apnea hypopnea index, central apnea index, oxygen desaturations, arousal. It improves the quality of life in terms of the Epworth sleepiness scale. That's a highly important difference. And it improves patient global assessment. And you see there that the patients who had this treatment had dramatically improved overall patient reported outcomes compared to the control patients. So in patients with heart failure, with central sleep apnea, who have very poor quality of life, we have a treatment now that improves quality of life, and that's associated with improvements both in patients with heart failure and in patients with central sleep apnea without heart failure. And of course, this condition is one in which conventional treatments of sleep apnea are not possible because the SERV trial showed that positive airway pressure mask was harmful in central sleep apnea patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So it's another 
device that can improve our heart failure patients if they've got central sleep apnea. I put it into this talk because it does it by preventing chain stokes respiration. And in doing that, it has a very beneficial effect on sympathovagal balance because chain stokes ventilation itself is associated with a very abnormal cardiopulmonary sympathovagal imbalance we see in chronic heart failure, which turns our attention to other autonomic modulation therapies. There are a number of companies and devices that have been targeting sympathovagal balance, either via stimulating the vagus, stimulating spinal afferents, stimulating the baroreflex system, or denervating the sympathetics and the renal artery. Each of those have been tested in various ways in heart failure or hypertension and with variable results. The trials are small. None of these companies are very wealthy. And so the, some of these early travel trials, very small numbers, 59 active versus 28 control for vagal stimulation, 66 patients for spinal cord stimulation, 146 for baroreflex, and the largest one, 725 for vagal stimulation. None of these were definitive, but the one with the most exciting results to date is baroreflex activation therapy, um, the, the CVRX device, um, called CardioStim, and that is designed to stimulate the carotid sinus, activates the baroreflexes, and leads to reflex withdrawal of sympathetic tone and augmentation of vagal tone. That leads to reduction in heart rate, an improvement of remodeling, vasodilatation, a reduction in blood pressure, and an increase in diuresis, because it's acting like an autonomic modulating therapy. This was evaluated in the Beach HF Pivotal Study. It also was a trial that was approved by the FDA through their new Breakthrough Devices Program that's specifically designed to encourage more development of devices in what are called orphan indications where there is no other effective treatment. So in heart failure, although we have many drugs, there is no treatment to modify sympathovagal imbalance directly. So this um, baroreflex activation therapy was approved for an FDA breakthrough device design. It was a multi-center prospective randomized control trial of baroreflex activation therapy compared to optimal medical therapy alone. NYHA functional class three patients, all with low ejection fractions, limited exercise tolerance, elevated N-terminal pro BNP, and standard optimal therapy. Patients who are eligible for CRT were excluded to make sure there was no interaction between the baroreflex stimulation and CRT. What was found is it's a slightly complex design, but there was an initial reduction in N-terminal pro-BNP, but it was found that the patients with very high levels didn't get a benefit. So there was a second cohort that was restricted to less than 1600 value for N-terminal pro-BNP. And that group, you got a greater reduction. So then they repowered the study and recruited more patients with the lower end terminal pro BNP. There was a significant improvement in functional capacity measured by six minute corridor walk test distance, both the initial cohort, the second cohort and the combined cohort, and a significant improvement in Minnesota living with heart failure score in all three cohorts of patients. That also was associated, and this trial is ongoing, but with the early look, because of this breakthrough devices, there is an early evaluation of the trial, and then there's further follow-up of these patients for cardiovascular events. But the early suggestion was a reduction in events, heart failure hospitalization, um, with the use of the baroreflex activation. Lastly, another very exciting field of it is an implant of devices that are designed to be placed in the atrial septum, which will allow left atrial to right atrial decompression, which can be useful for both HEFREF and HEFPEF, because they're both associated with increased left atrial pressures that can lead to pulmonary edema and other worsening of congestion. Here we see three manufacturer's devices, uh, slightly different designs. Some of them are valve, some of them aren't. And all three have been shown to reduce pulmonary artery pressures, reduce congestion, and in some cases improve exercise tolerance. But none of the trials have reached the stage where we have definitive outcome data as yet. 
So in summary, take home message, heart failure is complicated and we should think about device treatments as well as drug treatments. We need to treat the whole patient and not their heart. So many of these devices are not targeting the heart at all. So we have treatments for sleep apnea, we have treatments for um, baroreflex activation, uh, blockade of sympathetic nerve system, which is non-cardiac autonomic targets, an expanding role for electrotherapeutics, treating comorbidity such as sleep disorder, breathing, functional MR, and of course, we will see further improvement, miniaturization, and better batteries for left ventricular uh, assist devices. Happy to stop there and take any discussion or questions. Thank you, Dr. Coates, uh, for an amazing and lucid presentation on the devices uh, in heart failure and what exactly is going uh, and going to be the future of uh, the treatment of heart failure. So, uh, and are there any questions? Uh, we can, I mean, these are amazing. No, no, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, uh, this is to Dr. Andrew Coates. Uh, um, the limited success of the mitral clip and the carillon device is because heart failure has two components. One is the mitral regurgitation, and the second part is the left ventricular geometry, uh, which from a pyramid shape uh, changes to a spherical shape. So yes. the mitral clip and the carillon address only the mitral regurgitation and reduce the regurgitation, whereas the shape of the ventricle continues to be spherical. Wanted to know what are your thoughts on this? Absolutely. I mean, I think that there is further evaluation of reshaping, reshaping strategies. Um, people have tried surgery with put tip to the device. They've tried um, cages, baskets. They've tried clipping devices. So we know that the reduction of MR can have beneficial effects. But as you rightly point out, it's only addressing one aspect of left ventricular remodeling. So it's unlikely to be the magic bullet that dramatically change outcomes. However, the results of MitraClip in the COAP study, really quite encouraging. But the careful message of COAP, which I didn't stress, was these patients were incredibly carefully selected. They each had to go before a panel to be included. They were sent back for optimization of medical therapy. There were precise inclusion exclusion criteria. And what we stress in all our guidance documents is the use of mitral regurgitation reduction devices depends on critically accurate patient selection. It's not for everyone. So uh, there was uh, one study, the anthem HF trial, which uh, used uh, a device for the vagal stimulation, which you mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, study uh, didn't have a very significant, uh, uh, I mean, it, it didn't come out as a significant study. Uh, but do you think, uh, uh, I mean, it still is going to be a, a way of, to, uh, I mean, we should study more ab about this vagal stimulation with better, uh, by the autonomic changes to be defined? Yeah, I certainly do believe if, if we look at the pathophysiology of heart failure, the most consistent feature is abnormal sympathovagal balance. Sympatho excitation, vagal withdrawal is there from the very earliest ventricular damage. It's highly correlated with increased mortality and beneficial treatments like exercise training that improve patients with heart failure also improve it. The big issue we have with these electrotherapeutics is that we have very little data or information about the precise dose response. So unlike a drug where we tend to give it, we give 24 hour control um, and we, we measure something like blood pressure. For stimulation of the vagus, we don't know the frequency of stimulation, the intensity, do we need to do it for 24 hours a day? Are we better to give it for eight hours a day? Should we stimulate for five minutes and stop for three minutes? There are so many variables that it, we're almost guessing that we get the right stimulation frequency. So I personally believe it'll just take several years before we accidentally or by trial and error find the best way of stimulating. And the, the BEAT HF trial actually shows that we can get useful benefits, um, but we need to get better able at exactly how to do it, how frequently and what intensity. So Coach, that was an amazing talk. And I, I just wanted to know whether there are any devices where which could be used to reduce congestion, for example, to reduce the flow from the superior vena cava and all that. Some some uh, yeah, yeah. So yes, is it you, you, on that? Yeah, you, you must be very prescient or, or aware 
um, companies are looking at devices for decongestion. And there are a number of approaches. Of course, there's a lot of excitement about devices for assessing congestion, but devices for changing it. If you think about the possibilities, you can change renal function by renal denervation, um, by augmenting renal blood flow, or by changing intrarenal pressures. And if you put simple um, partial occlusion devices above or below the renal artery, you can change renal function and renal blood flow. So it's extremely early days, but I, there is an active effort, effort into whether you can decongest by devices. But I think it's gonna be many years before we know exactly how we use those devices. Dr. Coates, about cardiac contractility modulation that you mentioned. Yes. yes. Um, this particular trial, we have also been approached uh, for this, I guess it is from Impulse Dynamics. Impulse, yeah, that's the only manufacturer. Yes. A little bit intrigued, you know, because when it worked in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, it uh, worked by giving a stimulus in the absolute refractory period and by increasing the contractility. If you're talking about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, how would it work? Because I was also told by those people in a tele in a video call that some studies have shown a reduction in DP by DT in heart failure with pres preserved ejection fraction. So are these are not these two mechanisms kind of contradictory to each other? They are slightly. I mean, the 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 results are quite consistent. It really doesn't work well in very low ejection fractions. So the patients with you know single figure 10, 15 percent, they're not for CCM. You seem to need some residual contractility. And of course, I would stress that we now are believing that ejection fractions of 40 to 50, even to 55, maybe into 60, are not entirely normal. So I think it's still targeting a group population with mildly reduced ejection fraction. It's not, it's not true HEFPEF. But, but also go back to the mechanisms. And this is stimulating during the actual refractory period that changes intracellular calcium handling and the genes, gene expression. And that can enhance contractility where it's impaired, but it also can improve diastolic function and calcium handling. So it can get greater calcium reuptake and it can actually enhance diastolic recall as well as um, in some patient enhancing contractility. So I think we're a long way from knowing exactly how it works, but the, the evidence to date suggests there is, there is actually a sweet spot for benefit towards the upper end of the 25 to 35% range, which has encouraged people to look beyond 35% up to 40, 45, 50, and even 60. I personally think it's probably gonna be best between 30 and 50%, but that, that's just a personal um, guess. It's not, we don't have the trials as yet. Uh, Dr. Coates, if I can uh, extend uh, this question a little more. Uh, the CCM device occupies the space between an ICD and a CRT device, CRTD. Uh, that is because it is particularly designed for patients who do not have a left bundle branch block and yet have heart failure. So when you yeah. implant a, a CCM device, uh, how do you combat the uh, chance of uh, a sudden cardiac death by, uh, by an arrhythmic episode? Uh, is it that uh, you uh, uh, increase the dosage of antiarrhythmic drugs or should you implant an ICD along with the CCM? How do you tackle this kind of a problem? Well, I think that problem won't be a problem very soon because I was actually talking to um, the, the lead of Impulse Dynamics just a couple of days ago, and they have a device already rolling off that's a combined ICD with CCM. So you, you can have a um, ICD device that has the benefit of improving exercise capacity at the same time. So that, that probably will be the future, is that CCM will be an add-on to ICD, or there's a CCM that has an ICD incorporated in it. And what about this intraatrial shunting device? Uh, uh, the, the, does this, uh, this, this relief of symptoms uh, really extend longer, longer enough after the implant? Long enough? That's interesting. The, the trials haven't been very large to date. I was, I was there with the first implantation of the Corvair device, um, and that had dramatic benefits acutely in a patient with HEFPEF. Um, during supine exercise, the pulmonary artery pressures dropped, uh, 
and it's been associated with reduction in episode heart failure hospitalizations. I don't think anyone's got any convincing evidence for reduction in mortality, but how does it work? It's probably not by a continuous um, benefit working all the time, but it's patients often have episodic increases in left atrial pressure, and it's like a so graded decompression. Um, also, you have to be very careful with the patients. Don't do it with people with extremely high uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. You, you've got to modify the size of the shunt. You don't want the QP to QS ratio to go beyond 1.5, 2 to 1. So I think it's, it's likely to be beneficial in people with episodic heart failure and congestion for that intermittent decongestion. Thank you so much. So I think uh, this has been a great uh, learning experience for from Dr. Coates about the devices and the future of devices. Thank you, Dr. Coates, uh, for this excellent lecture. Can we move on to the next topic? And uh, we have a session from Dr. Uday Jadav, please. So we are starting the other yeah, sector. Let me discuss with you some aspects of uh, the, the diagnostic monitoring and therapy of uh, acute decompensated heart failure. This being a physician's module, we'll try and keep it uh, as simple as possible. This is one chart which is extremely important for all our hospitals and uh, clinicians. So if we look at the probability of death based on the score, simply putting it this way, let's say as just one example, if you have a young patient between the age of 50 to 60 years and his systolic blood pressure is 90 to 100, he has a score of 28, right? And uh, he gets 11 points here because he's between 50 and 60 age. He gets another 28 points there because his systolic blood pressure is low, that's 39. His heart rate more than 105, 47. He doesn't have a COPD. And let's say his bun is between 50 and 60. So you're dealing with a total score of 55 to 60, that turns out to be a mortality between 5 to 10 percent. You have another patient who is between the age of 60 and 70, and now you look at his systolic blood pressure, still lesser, between 80 and 90, and his heart rate is more and doesn't have a COPD, and his bun is still a little high then his score goes anywhere around 65. So this mortality becomes 10 to 15 persons. Remember, hypo and hypernatremia both take into account in, when, you, when you equalize the scores. So this simple scoring system helps you to understand how sick are your acute heart failure patients and how are you going to treat them in clinical practice. Let's look at some of the monitoring and tests in acute heart failure. These are some of the guidelines that you need to obviously do their renal functions every single day or second day. It's important to check their procalcitonin to be sure that they don't have an important co coexisting infection. The liver enzymes, AST and ALT, are important. They do get elevated, as we know, because patients undergo a reduced output and increased venous congestion. But mind you, they do uh, reflect upon a poor prognosis. We must check patients for the thyroid status. We need to know their iron profile. And of course, echocardiography is vital. It's, it's not just doing the echocardiography once, even if there has been a pre-existent echocardiography report a couple of days back or three days back, it's still vital to do it on admission and follow up quickly as and when you need it because it really guides your treatment well. One of the important papers that um, came up in Jack about five years back tells us 
that hypernatremia is as important as hyponatremia. In fact, hypernatremia is associated with a much higher 28-day mortality, six-fold higher as compared to hyponatremia, where it's just about two-fold at 28 days and a year. So keep this in mind that a high sodium is also a risk factor. The biomarkers, cardiac troponins, they are elevated in acute heart failure and they do help in detection of ACS, but it's important to understand that there may not be an obvious myocardial ischemia or an acute coronary events. In patients who have an underlying pulmonic embolism and acute heart failure, we all know that it's a very important tool. The natriuretic peptides, which we commonly use, has two very important aspects for our clinicians and physicians. A normal level with a suspected acute heart failure makes it absolutely unlikely that these patients do have a heart failure. The elevated levels, though, do not necessarily confirm that there is a heart failure, and there can be a wide variety of cardiac and non-cardiac causes, as you are all aware of. What is important to remember, you can have unexpectedly low levels of the natriuretic peptides in patients with decompensated end-stage heart failure, fresh pulmonic edema, or a right-sided heart failure. ST2, a value of the sensitive presage ST2 value about 35 nanograms, not only reflects a bad prognosis, helps you to identify mortality. In fact, you can almost look at it as a HbA1c of heart failure, exactly like we look at the glycemia of a patient who comes with acute heart failure. And it's not influenced by age, gender, the renal function, unlike the BNPs. And it's much better than galactin-3. And when you combine it with the natriuretic peptides, you are able to discriminate and reclassify these patients in a much better way. Also, we'll tell you over a period of time that it's a good predictor of sudden heart death. So let's come to the important therapeutics now. I will encourage you to read some of these articles which are highlighted here for diuretic therapy and inotropes in Jack and uh, the European Heart Journal. And I'll base some of my slides on this. It's vital for physicians to understand few relevant concepts on diuretic therapy. It's important that we start with the intravenous bolus dose. Patients who do not respond to intravenous bolus dose will not respond well to the continuous infusion. After, infu after a bolus dose, a continuous infusion of 5 mg per hour is good in patients with intact renal function. But mind you, once the GFR goes down, you can actually increase the rate of the uh, furosemide infusion and it helps. Within half an hour, you should expect a peak diuresis uh, once it starts. And over a period of two hours, it does get established very well. Now, how do you monitor in your uh, hospitals and nursing homes and wherever you work? The two strategies of which the oldest strategy is the established pathway. Look at the urine output. If it's more than 150 ml per hour, you know that these patients are doing really well and you can switch over to a twice a day, maybe intravenous bolus of furosemide or tosemide. If it's less than 150 ml per hour, then one should administer IV loop diuretics at twice the dose and then increase the dose as required. And look whether the goal of urine output has been, has been maintained. The other way, and probably a very sensible way, and if you put both these strategies together, excellent. Check the urine sodium. The spot urine sodium more than 50 to 70 millimoles, exactly like your urine output, which is more than 150, follow the same guidelines. You can switch over to short bolus dose. And if it's less than 50 to 70 ml, then you have to prop up the dose of furosemide. If then the response is not adequate, we have the options of adding either a thiazide 
uh, acetazolamide, uh, aldosterone antagonists, or in our country, often metazolone. Hypertonic saline in patients who are refractory, or what we say diuretic resistance acute heart failure, have a element of a role to play, though this is a little preliminary data. Uh, and it's not that it's absolute contraindication that you should not give it through the peripheral vein. You can, and it's not necessary that it needs to be given only in intensive care units. If the blood pressure of systole is less than 90, then you will give the ionotropes. If it's more than 90, try and use a vasodilator. And I'm going to show you this chart a little more thoroughly based on some very important principles. The ionotropes enhance the cardiac uh, contractility, as we know. So you have some beta agonists, the milrinone and levosimendan, which are extremely useful. Please do use it in low output acute uh, heart failure. Identifying these patients is often challenging, and therefore we need to look at what they do. Here is a great comparative chart of the three class of drugs, the adrenergic receptor, the is the calcium sensitizer, and the phosphodiesterase inhibitor. So if you look at them in a, in a careful sort of way, they have different effect on the alpha and the beta 1 receptors. But what is important to remember, they all have ionotropic effect. The arterial vasodilatation is excellent with levosimendan and with the phosphodiesterase inhibitor. The pulmonary vasodilatation is not really substantial at all or even will reduce with your dopamine and dobutamine and the norepinephrine and epinephrine infusion. This is where lev levosimendan and milrinone scores. They cause a, a pulmonary vasodilatation. Um, you can prefer one out of the two. There is a very good data with levosimendan. One of the reasons also is that uh, you have a half-life, which is elimination half-life is much less, or 1.3 hours makes it easy to use. And let's say for a 60 kg uh, uh, person, after a bolus dose, if at all you have to use it, uh, you can use anywhere between 4 to 12 micrograms per minute as a infusion. Now, are we set for this? So there are some very important slides. This is the in-hospital mortality over a month. And if you look at your traditional drugs, norepinephrine and epinephrine and dopadobitamine, the levosimendan looks so very good in terms of keeping the in-hospital mortality down. I mean, you're looking at 50% in very sick person down to about 5 to 10%. That's a substantial difference uh, against the, the older drugs and also against dopamine and dobutamine. Now, one of the reasons is if you take dobutamine or dopamine or milrinol, they affect the afferent arteriol and the efferent arteriol, right? Levosimendan has an effect only on the afferent arteriol. It spares the efferent arteriol. Therefore, you are able to maintain the glomerular filtration and even when the GFR falls, as we'll see, it works so very well in terms of uh, maintaining the renal perfusion and having a effective vasodilatation. So here is the comparison, a very nice slide between levosimendan and dobutamin. So you can see at the basal GFR and after 24, 48 and 72 hours, the progressive improvement that you get, you get a flattened out chart with dobutamine. So here is the European guideline, which I really like. I really appreciate this, that step one, when you see these patients, do you need ionotrope? A low cardiac output with a BP of less than 90, cold extremities, oliguric, skin mortal, mental status altered, serum lactate high, hepatic enzymes high, are, are good criteria. Look for treatable uh, causes. If there are lack of treatable causes as mentioned, you are better off. Now, it's important to do that. Treat the cause rather than jumping to inotropes. What inotrope is the most important, appropriate? 
This, let us remember, if the patient has been on a chronic beta blocker therapy, you should prefer levosimendan or milrinol. If he's in cardiogenic shock, levosy, uh, or dobitamine plus norepinephrine, RV failure, levosimendan, cardiorenal syndrome, very important. That's the bulk of our patients. In fact, I feel levosimendan. Ischemic heart disease, levosimendan or dobitamine, septic cardiomyopathy, norepinephrine plus dobitamine, takasubo, levosimendan. So this is a very nice chart of how you keep this patient. What is the time to wean the ionotropes when patients get better? Symptoms, vital signs, invasive parameters, serum lactate, diuresis, and echoindysis. Can you start sacubitril valsartan early? Of course, you know this. Now, this is a couple of years since the slides are on. Transition and Pioneer tried to look at, can you achieve the target dose at 10-week post-randomization? Yes, of course. A majority of the patient uh, could maintain it for at least two weeks, leading to 10 weeks after the randomization. There are very few patients who went off the shelf. And also, the biomarkers, NP, got so much better and lowered. Safety tolerability was better over eight weeks. So now, there is a way to initiate in patients of acute heart failure, circumetrial valsartan. The message is still the same. Start a low dose, monitor the patient well, slowly uptight it to the dose, but not very slowly. Start increasing the dose to the permissible limit so that you are able to achieve at least some efficacy by the time patient goes home. A uh, lot of interesting thoughts have recently come up after the sotagliflozin data uh, in patients with recent worsening heart failure. You have much more to come. I mean, this data was a bit preliminary. It came in the COVID days when patients could not be randomized further. But it told us a very important uh, message that uh, CV deaths and hospitalization and urgent visits went down with sotagliflozin, a dual combinator of SG1 and SG2, LT2 inhibition. So there is now a way to treat patients who have been recently hospitalized for worsening heart failure and start them on SGLT2 inhibitors a little early. It's not always easy to do that in clinical practice, as we'll see. And uh, iron deficiency is not anemia. It's a distinct clinical conditions and heart failures, but chronic and acutely can have anemia. It's the FM acute heart failure that looks at hospitalization mortality in patients with acute heart failure. I do believe that before patients go home, check their serum ferritin levels, look at the TSATs, and uh, if the ferritin levels are low, or if the serum ferritin levels and the TSATs are combined, and the criteria fulfills, it's good to give uh, uh, FCM before they go home. So what are we saying? Having said all this, a patient of heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction and acute heart failures, when you look at the chronicity of the disorder, the spending function is affected by four major aspects. The heart rate, the blood pressure, the EGFR, and the potassium. And when I think about the patients whom we see in our intensive care units with acute heart failure, or acute decompensated heart failure, it's, it's the same. So when we say, let me initiate therapy with all these drugs, we still look at those parameters very carefully because they are the deciding parameters by which you will be able to escalate the doses or maintain the doses at a time frame where patients can go home on a reasonably optimized therapy. And as you will listen to in the further talks, post-stabilization, this pending function will decide how patients do well in practice. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you there for a very lucid presentation and giving, us a clear, giving a clear cut message on use of inotropes and diuretics in heart failure. Uh, uh, the question I think for which most of the physicians ask is...
What about tosimide? Do you differentiate uh, tosimide from flozimide? When which do you compare? Yeah, 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 yeah. Heart, heart failure. Yeah. So there has been there is advantage naturally because uh, you look upon a longer acting uh, molecule and probably the diuretic resistance is a little better. It's not that it greatly uh, you do nothing wrong. If, one does nothing wrong if patients are given uh, flusamide in, uh, instead. I don't see any problem with that. A bolus dose of flusamide would work equally well. But yes, tosamide has those advantages of, uh, give, uh, of be, being uh, having a longer half-life and you can use it uh, at lesser frequency. Uh, the infusions can be given in the same way. And uh, uh, probably there is a little less diuretic resistance, but I'll welcome the comments on that. So I think the, the issues are mostly with the oral tosamide rather than rather than the parental. I think the parental would work even in a chronic heart failure compensation. It wouldn't make a difference. It's only the only sure. preparation that the whole problem is assessing. Any any questions? There are two there are two uh, points. You know, one is that the electrolyte disturbances are supposed to be a little bit less with tosamide, and second is that the bioabsorption of tosamide is better than uh, fusimide, but given intravenously, there is very little difference. No difference. Yeah, uh, so Dr. Jadav, uh, this is for the physicians. Uh, what level of uh, sodium are you comfortable with? So anything less than this value or anything more than this value should have a red flag in the ICU. I mean, it's pretty linear in terms of, uh, you know, the hyponatremia part. It's pretty linear. That means every drop in the milli equivalent of sodium will make a difference. A sodium level more than 131 or 132 looks to be a reasonably good sodium. Uh, as it drops to 128 and below, you start looking at uh, increased morbidity and uh, mortality, of course, as it becomes very less. Uh, it's not an individual marker for the red flag. We'll have to combine it with the other points also, including the the burn. Burn is very important, the blood urea nitrogen. And what about hypernitremia? I mean, I did say that the mortality is much, much higher with hypernitremia than with hyponatremia. You can also be dealing with a very hypovolemic patient at that point of time, and the renal perfusion can must have dropped significantly also. Uh, Uday, sir, two questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, do you consider invasive hemodynamic monitoring only in patients with cardiogenic shock or the sicker ones? Or uh, would you use it uh, routinely so that uh, your fluid balance and your uh, value, values of CVP and so on would be uh, well titrated and adequate? And more importantly, you can do a good dosage adjustment uh, for such patients. That is question number one. Uh, the uh, so you, you'll answer this, then I'll take the, uh, then I'll give you the next question. Okay. I, actually, there was a slide on it, which I did not include because I thought uh, that's too much of a topic to cover. But yes, if the patients are very sick, that's the point of time where the entire invasive hemodynamic monitoring will be important. Monitoring the venous pressures are absolutely required. I mean, I do not see how we are going to manage acute heart failures without uh, at least a venous pressure monitoring. The arterial hemodynamics will become important as patients become more sicker, particularly if you want to keep this balance between uh, the inodilators uh, and the therapies of uh, volume reduction. So there are specific guidelines being given by the ESC and we can follow the same guidelines. But if you look at it in a practical viewpoint, you start, cannot recommend it uh, across the board for all small hospitals and all clinicians. That's not as easy. So my second question is timing of the medications for heart failure in a patient on inotropes. When would you time the introduction of uh, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARVs right. and so on? Right, right. So the old conventional belief is that if the patients are a little wet, then you do not initiate the beta blockers. But now we know that you can start initiating early as possible. The requirement for... Uh, uh, RD, let's talk of, about RD, is that you still need to have a patient for at least 24 hours of their inotrope supports of the intravenous loop diuretic infusions. They can be on nitroglycerins, that's okay. So you will want all these drugs to be off for about 24 to 48 hours before initiating a small dose of well satin and then going back. SGLT2 inhibitors, 
MRS can be initiated early, maybe on the fourth, fifth day once the, the, the intravenous supports go out. SGLT2 inhibitors in acute heart failure, in the setting of acute heart failure, we need to still uh, await the, the data on that, and Vijay may probably add to that. The only uh, reasonable trial we have is sotagliflozin. Of course, it, it happened during the COVID days, and we did not have, they did not have enough enrollment. But close to 50% of those patients were enrolled 48 hours before they got discharged, just before discharge. And uh, uh, the remaining 50% were uh, at a two uh, mean days duration after the discharge. So it looks like probably SGLT2 inhibitors, not in chronic heart failure, but in the acute heart failure setting, can be initiated just proximal to the discharge, provided other clinical parameters allow you to do that because we are going to initiate ARNI a little more earlier. Vijayani comments in that. We took part in the sotagliflozin trial and it was very disappointing that the trial was stopped early because of finances and because of the COVID. But what came out from the two trials, SCORD and SOLEST, was something amazing. Solis, of course, told us that um, half the patients were enrolled, significant number of patients were enrolled uh, where the drug was started pretty early, but definitely within the um, period of hospitalization and benefit was visible. So uh, the other trials which I've mentioned or other recommendations which are coming out is that certainly before the discharge, SGLT2 inhibitors could be started. So whether they are started on day four or day five, it doesn't matter. But since they have very little hemodynamic or electrolyte disturbances, they could be started or they should be started uh, probably before the patient is discharged from the hospital. Uday, well, another, another question to you. You made a very important message. I think you gave a message that when you, your patient is on a beta blocker and then you want an inotrope, it's preferable to avoid dobutamine. Yes. Uh, more so, more so if it's carbidilol. But then some people feel that you really increase the dosage of dobutamine, you can overcome that the the uh, the problem. In fact, uh, uh, so may not be low dose, maybe a little higher dosage of dobutamine may overcome this problem. What is your your take on that? Yes. Yeah, so in twenty twenty one, in fact, after these guidelines from ESC came, there has been a comparison in that set of patient between dobutamine and levosimetan, and they did not see a great difference in uh, really not a statistically significant difference between morbidity and mortality both on the, in the early phase and up to 90 days so uh, what you say is true lecithin is expensive medication also so you may increase the dobutamine to a higher dose and then you are okay you can do that and also another another thing for the physicians some of them may be very fond of using dopamine uh, a low dose, maybe when you, particularly if you have a cardiorenal syndrome, for better for the renal perfusion dose. Do you think the, in the current era it has any place? Not really, not really, not really. Dr. Jadav, uh, fantastic presentation. I have one uh, question. Given a choice uh, between the patient, what will you choose for what patient, whether milrinone or liver seminar? Which particular patient would you go for milrinone and which particular patient you would go for liver seminar? They are very close to each other. There are just a couple of uh, maybe small differentiating points is that you have a longer washout period and half-life with milrinone. So that's where liver cemented has an advantage. One, two, uh, milrinone will act both on the afferent and efferent glomerular artery also. If you have a patient where the GFR is a concern or the renal perfusion is dropping, then because levosimendan will work only on the afferent artery wall, you do have data that it goes superior to milrinone. So between the two, levosimendan has an edge. Both are good, uh, efficient pulmonary arterial vasodilators. So that way it works very well. Surgeons are very fond of epinephrine. Yes. Yeah. Uh, surgeons they use a lot of levosimendan and milrinone. Use vasopressin. Yeah, I think so. Levosimendan with uh, vasopressin or milrinone with vasopressin is a very fantastic combination, good, good combination. particularly in patients with uh, high pH. In that uh, category, noradrenaline instead of noradrenaline, you can use vasopressin. Yeah. 
Hey, thank you. Thank, thank you, Uday. I think we are running short thank of time. Thank yeah. you for thank you. the presentation. So can we go to the next presentation, please? Yes, good evening all. Uh, I have a live presentation to make. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to make the things. Can I be allowed to share my screen? Yes, sir, you yeah. can share, sir. Okay. I'm just, uh, yes. Um, surgical therapies in heart failure is my talk, including heart transplantation. I'm fully aware that this talk is directed to the physicians, and I will try to be um, not very technical, not going to too much of detail. And my entire scope would be to give an overview of what surgery can offer to heart failure patients. And um, when surgery is indicated, when it is not indicated, and what are the complications and outcomes, just um, not going into much of a detail. As I said, this is an overview. Talk a little bit about heart failure and surgery for heart failure. When it says including transplant, it obviously means that is non-transplant options as well, including MCH and MCS stands for mechanical circulatory support. The causes of heart failure could be diseases of one of the three. It could be disease of blood vessels causing ischemia and ischemic cardiomyopathy. It is a disease of muscles de novo causing three types of myopathy, either dilated or hypertrophic or restrictive cardiomyopathy, or end-stage heart failure due to valvular disease. Now, if you look at the syndromes, the patient could either present as an acute heart failure example a cardiogenic shock following an acute myocardial infarction or could have gradually developing heart failure as in uh, chronic heart failure <clears throat> so the non-transplant options are all going to be high risk because patient has high failure heart failure it will be revascularization such as cabg or a complication of mi a mechanical complication such as a ventricular septal rupture a papillary muscle rupture causing acute mr or a free wall rupture causing a tamponade similarly mitral and aortic disease causing heart failure can be fixed by mitral and aortic surgery LV restorative surgery for LV aneurysm and mechanical circulatory support. There's a differentiation between hibernating and stent myocardium, and we have techniques such as PET, MR, uh, the view stress echo to differentiate the two. So revascularization with COBT, there are two big landmark trials, the SISH trial in 2011 and an extended SISH trial in 2016. Basically, what this means is if you compare medical therapy alone with CABG in patients with L left ventricular dysfunction, in the long run, at 10 years, surgery performs better in terms of improvement in all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. The second thing tested was CABG versus CABG and ventricular restoration. There was no difference between the two. Now, when the patient has a mitral regurg with LV dysfunction and coronary artery disease, mitral surgery has been done, but there are only very small trials. Data is conflicting. So there are instances where an isolated mitral surgery has been done. Between valve repair and valve replacement, initially valve repair is better, but in due course, they also again fail, so replacement in the long term is better. So mechanical circulatory support could either be short term or long term. Short term is something one we all know is the intraaortic balloon form, ECMO again, which supports both the lung and the heart. Other examples are centrimag and impella is not really a surgical one. It is within the domain of the cardiologist, which is inserted percutaneously. So in a heart failure, you're given all the medications, the diuretics, the iron. Improved survival. Now, these are the lists of mechanical circulatory support. You could have a ECMO VAT. VAT stands for a ventricular assist device. Now, what does the mechanical circulatory support help us with? It helps us to bridge a lot of things. One, now let's say there was a patient with an acute myocardial infarction. He develops ventricular fibrillation. He has a cardiac arrest. We have done a... <clears throat> 
cardio pulmonary resuscitation. There has been no response, no return of circulation. We put a percutaneous ECMO. We get the circulation back, but we get the cardiac function back. But we don't know if this chap has got significant neurological injury. So we wait for 24 hours, keep them on support, switch off the sedation, and see if there is neurological recovery. If there is no neurological recovery, you make a decision of stopping the treatment or to continue further. Bridge to recovery, classically in myocarditis, when you have uh, uh, heart failure, you can use these mechanical circuits supports when inotropes and drugs don't work and give the support until it recovers sometimes you can these are short term like for example ECMO or centrimag is short term the patient continues to be in a heart failure you can use what is called a durable or a left ventricular assist device and maintain the end organ functions until the heart is available for transplant most often we see when we implant the left ventricular assist device patient themselves say enough is enough doctor I'm very happy with how things are. I don't want to transplant. And then, you know, they themselves choose to be destination therapy. However, the indication for destination therapy is for patients for whom heart transplant is contraindicated. So as I told you, in heart failure, mechanical circulatory support preserves end organs. In acute heart failure, it improves survival and allows bridging. So what are these things in chronic heart failure? You have durable VAT, such as LVAD, which is a left ventricular assist device, right ventricular assist device, or biventricular. Sometimes we have a total artificial heart. The whole philosophy of these is it preserves and maintains the kidney, the liver function, and the other organs until such time a heart is available for transplant. So this is just a picture showing the various devices available. IABP we are uh, familiar with, percutaneous uh, <coughs> ventricular assist device. The one on the left is Impella, which is inserted commonly by the cardiologist in the cath lab. It goes across the aortic route and provides flow of two to five liters. A tandem heart requires a septal puncture. So you enter the small way, go through the IVC, right atrium, puncture, and go into the left side. And you have a venous draining cannula from the femoral and the return cannula to the femoral artery. Centrimag is done surgically. You can either provide a left heart support, or right heart support, or bioventricular support. So ECMO has now become a uh, household name following uh, the corona pandemic where it is used for lung support. What most people also don't realize is it can be used for heart support as well. It can be a veno arterial providing heart support or a veno venous providing just lung support. It can be used after cardiac surgery when the heart doesn't come off bypass. It can be used as a BTT, which is a bridge for transplantation, or a right ventricular failure after heart transplantation. These are pictures of the one on the left is um, left ventricular assist device. As you can see, it drains blood from the left ventricle and it goes into the aorta. It provides support to the failing left ventricle. The one on the right side is a total artificial heart. There are a few trials which have looked at the various uh, ventricular assist device, and this just is a complex thing. Uh, axial flow where the older generation, now we've got centrifugal pumps. Now these LVADs or left ventricular assist device fit within a palm, and that is a chest x-ray showing uh, a, a ventricular device in place. Uh, a couple of trials which pretty much show there are two major uh, LVADs in the market, which is Hardware and Hardmade 2. Both of them had pros and cons. <laughs> now, this is a Hardmade 3, the most latest one, uh, which uses magnetic levitation for uh, centrifugal pump. Now, the Momentum 2 trial compared the previous generation, Hardmade 2, with the current generation. The current generation has lesser stroke and thrombosis. And the problem with all the left ventricular assist devices, pretty much like a mobile phone that needs charging. So there is a lead, a power lead coming out of the body, which is connected to uh, external console. Now, it should be charged whenever, uh, at all times. <clears throat> now, that is one of the negative points. Now, currently, we have uh, patients without charging special belt they can wear and they can trans, um, transfer the power to uh, a console which is embedded inside the chest. This is the next revolution of ventricular assist device. 
Uh, it is hoped that charging can be done via Wi-Fi, so patients with these implanted, fully implanted LWARs can go into a, a shopping mall or a theater, plex, multiplex, and there are some charging stations where you can get your LWAR charged. Total artificial heart, as the name implies, it, it replaces both the right and the left ventricle. Uh, the atrium are left behind and they serve as a preload. So we now come to heart transplantation. At this point in time, for an end-stage heart failure where all therapy has been tried, all has failed, heart transplantation is the goal. Uh, it needs to be assessed by a lot of uh, specialists, but there are two main viewpoints, disease aspect and patient aspect, and that is something called a transplant window. So you don't, have, you don't want to transplant a patient too early during the disease, so you think about a transplant when only when all options have failed. If not, transplant comes with its own share of problems such as rejection and infection and complication of anti-rejection pills. So unless the patient has earned it, meaning all options have been tried and all have failed, you don't think about a transplant. At the same time, if you wait too long and multi-organ failure sets in, then he becomes too risky for a transplant. For that point, there are two scoring systems. One is called the Seattle Heart Failure Model. I'm sure all of you can Google it and you find that is a calculator which you can calculate in your clinic with the patient sitting opposite to you. You enter all the data. It gives you a predicted survival in one year. If the predicted survival in one year is more than 90%, you don't send him for a transplant. If the predicted survival is less than 80%, you think of a transplant. Now, why so? Because the current results, the survival after lung transplant is in excess of 90%. But if you gain the same thing without transplant, why use referent for transplant? However, if the expected survival is less than 80, is only 60 or 70, heart failure has a better chance. Another scoring system is a heart failure scoring system, but that is a little more complex because that needs the use of a, a CPEC machine, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, whereas a Seattle heart failure model can be done in your clinic just using the calculator. It predicts one, two, and third year. If the survival is less than 80%, you think about transplant. So if there is an ambulatory uh, patient, you can calculate the Seattle heart failure survival score. If the survival is less than 80%, think of a transplant. If it is more than 90%, he's doing good, don't do a transplant. So the single most thing about uh, heart transplant is development of pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension in the initial stages can be reversible. But in the long run, it becomes irreversible. So if that is irreversible pulmonary hypertension, if you do a heart transplant, the right ventricle of the transplanted heart will fail. It will need support such as an RVAD, or maybe you may lose the patient. So we do what we call a pulmonary vascular resistance. If it is less than 1.5 to 2, it is good. More than 4 to 4.5 is not good. We test using NTG, dobutamine, milrinone, nitric oxide. The, the, the problems with heart transplant, lifelong is a possible rejection versus infection. So how do you monitor that? You have endomyocardial biopsy. You put a, a bioptome, a small instrument through the internal jugular vein under uh, uh, <coughs> CRM and echo control or in the cat lab, you can take biopsies from the right ventricle. So if we talk about the results of the heart transplant, the one year current survival is 90%, the five year survival is 70, 10 year is 50, and 20 year is 20%. You need to understand that you're talking about patients who would not have seen the next birthday. In such patients, a 10 year survival of 50% is very, very impressive. And so far to date, there is no other therapy as good as this. I thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Now, how do I stop sharing? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sundar, uh, for a lucid presentation on on this on the surgical aspect of heart failure. And I'm I'm sure I think your your thoughts uh, are very very clear that uh, the heart transplant uh, thing should be only be considered if all the things are, are not covered, if the patient doesn't go through the 
uh, to the complete stages because uh, balancing when to do it and if you are too late is the important uh, in this kind in this group of patients. Any any question? No uh, question. Uh, many times uh, deciding between an LVAD and a BIVAD is a very tricky situation <laughs> because the right ventricle looks. Uh, a little decompensated, there is mild dysfunction and the volumes are uh, a little more than normal. So, how? Uh, what is your strategy in deciding uh, when to go for just an LVAD and when to go for a BIVAD? Yeah, that's quite an interesting question and a very common problem. Um, by and large, uh, I mean, there are some indices, I mean, objective indices, but generally, when we put a BIVAD, uh, sorry, an LVAD, there is some amount of right ventricular problems, which is which can be judiciously managed in the ICU with the various therapies that you have. At rest, if such things fail, and that affects, because obviously if the right ventricle doesn't pump enough, you're not going to get blood into the LVAD. Uh, a short-term use of mechanical circulatory support with an ECMO configuration or a centrimac for the right ventricle can help it. But the great majority, I would say, uh, we can handle it without our VAD unless the RV is really, really too. And even in such cases, a short-term mechanical circulatory support within centrimac for maybe three, four days or five days. If centrimac is not available, an ECMO used as an RVAD function, by and large, um, you know, improves the condition. Okay, so the, the great presentation as usual. You have been very fantastic in expressing all the views and all the uh, ideas in a very short uh, period of time. Uh, and I totally agree that uh, with the advent of this mechanical circulatory support system, the treatment of heart failure has become a very fantastic area and we can really fight it out till the end for all the patients. But the only limiting factor in India is always the cost factor but slowly the people have started accepting it and with the towers and everything going in a big bang people have started even accepting this uh, LVAD therapy also so fantastic thing uh, I have one very small question uh, particularly from the uh, physician's point of view if a patient is of ischemic uh, a patient is having triple vessel disease with uh, EF of 15 to 20 percent EF there is always a dilemma whether that patient should be subjected for a CABG or should that patient go for directly a heart transplantation. That uh, dilemma is always there. So how do you deal with that? Okay. Uh, me, me, me on a personal front would, would go for some more invasive assessments. Uh, one, you look at the quality of the vessels and the distal possible distal vessels, are they graftable? The combination of a poor ventricle with good graftable vessels is good, or a good ventricle with poor vessels also is handleable. But when you have a very severely depressed LV with bad targets, then obviously we are not going to achieve revascularization, is one. The second is, although the STITCH trial suggests that if you blindly do revascularization and LV dysfunction without doing viability studies, I would be keen to do a viability study to see if there is enough quantum of myocardium which can be harnessed with revascularization and look at the status of the right ventricle also. If the right ventricle is dysfunctional in a case with LV dysfunction and severe triple vessel disease, CABG is extremely, I would use the word prohibitive high risk. Getting such patients out would be quite difficult. But if the right ventricle is okay, the targets are okay, I think the benefits to a CABG is better than transplant for many reasons. Uh, financial is one. If financial is not a consideration, exposing this person to a lifelong possibility of infection and rejection is probably not there. So, severe LV dysfunction, good targets, sir, CABG. And in this uh, modern era, I think so, the cardiac MRI has been a very fantastic tool to really identify whether that patient has any viable myocardium. Because I have seen that in uh, many of this PET scan or the thalium scan, the results are very ambiguous and you don't get the fair, uh, adequate results. 
but cardiac mri does show plastic scars and you can really delineate how many percentage of myocardium is dead and based on that you can really decide whether that, that patient will benefit by cabg or not absolutely absolutely it's fantastic and what about the on, a, that, on a lighter note with so many cardiologists present it all started with teva it started with tavi then mitrat left so i think the time is not far enough when you have a subcutaneous heart transplant also done soon maybe in the next 10 years or so <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, can I suggest one question? Okay. You have a person with ejection fraction of say twenty percent, a left mental branch block, recurrent heart failure hospitalizations. How do you decide whether this person should get a CRTD or should he go straight for heart transplantation now? So this is for Bhagirath and for the surgeons and for anybody else. I'll wait till all the other panelists have answered, and you know what my answer is going to be, sir. We know. Bagirat, it's a common question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are you asking everybody or somebody particular? No, as, uh, as Dr. Diren rightly pointed out, an MRI comes extremely handy in this decision making. So, if you have a large area of scar tissue, and then if you have extensive fibrosis, we do a fibrosis score and. Uh, uh, if uh, there is a lot of fibrosis, then this heart is not going to recover, and the purpose of a CRTD is then reduced to just the ICD function. You are not going to have an improvement uh, um, in the overall left ventricular function just because a CRTD is inserted. So, in such cases, a transplant becomes an automatic choice. Mm -hmm. However, if you have a reasonable amount of contractile tissue left, not much of scarring, then uh, a CRTD, of course, it should fulfill the other criteria. Of uh, EF being less than 35, a left bundle branch block being uh, uh, present, and of course, uh, uh, to a certain extent, the echo can contribute in uh, finding out the dysfunctional uh, segments. Bhagirat, would the ischemic etiology make a difference? Sorry, sir. Ischemic or non-ischemic etiology would it make a difference? Yes, ischemic or non-ischemic. Uh, as a protocol in in our hospital, we follow both uh, uh, the SPECT uh, protocol as well as the MRI protocol. Uh, as Dr. Diren rightly pointed out, an MRI is a one-stop shop wherein we can identify everything, except uh, so, you know uh, actually seeing the coronary anatomy for which a CT scan is better. All other information we can get from an MRI. So. With this MRI, uh, we would be able to decide whether it's ischemic, non-ischemic, viable, not viable, and then based on that, we can take a decision and it can be validated. And also, also in a challenge during the COVID times, the transplant in the COVID times. Yeah, in in COVID time also, we have transplanted many hearts. So I think so that is not a contra contraindication at all. Yes, Dr. Sundar may agree to that. Uh, regarding this uh, CRTD, I would always uh, think from the financial aspect also, because putting in CRTD is going to cost you up to uh, nine lakh or ten lakh rupees, and then within two or three years, patient needs a heart transplantation, they are out of money. So in that case scenario, we always think from that point of view, if the patient requires transplantation in one or one or two years or three years. Better to go for heart transplantation directly instead of bridging it with uh, CRTD. Mohan, you wanted to say something. Muted, you're muted. I agree with the comments being made, but I actually not only on cardiac MRI, but I rely quite a bit on echo. You might say echo doesn't provide anything more than MRI. That's not so. Actually, patients who have uh, uh, who have free wall uh, hollow systolic stretch uh, are the people who are unlikely to improve. I don't have to do a cardiac MRI. I can do a thing which costs thirty dollars, and I can give you an answer. Actually, if there if there are if there are if there are if there are a, wall, a free wall which has a hollow systolic stretch, be sure he's not he or she is not going to improve CRT. That that is for sure. Actually, um, uh, this guy. Um, uh, Sharif Nagy actually quite some time back did a very good study and he showed that uh, in case you have a irreversible kind of restrictive flow, restrictive idle flow, most of these people have a lot of non-viable tissue and they don't, don't respond to CRD. 
So uh, there are a lot of a lot of ways one can look at these things and uh, come to some kind of conclusion. You don't have to. Of course, cardiac MRI, as you rightly said, is is a one stop shop, and we should use it more often than we are using at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, at least north actually is being used much less. I know there is a there, there is a big uh, um, a big use actually in southern part of the country, but in northern part is not so much. And so our exp and the exp uh, people with great experience in cardiac MRI few and far, uh, and and so I, I think there are, there are multiple ways we can, we can look at. And uh, <laughs> there are left ventricular branch blocks and there are left ventricular branch blocks. And I would say you will look at them also. Sir, every every hospital doesn't have Professor J.C. Mohan to do an echo, sir. So for lesser models, we have to rely on MRI. <laughs> Can I have a small, quick question? Yeah. Yeah. So there are a lot of uh, transplant uh, patients now coming up. So what is the protocol the surgeons follow in terms of follow-up echoes in these patients? Uh, right. Because these patients are keep on they keep on moving at different part of the cities. So what what are the recommendations uh, you guys follow? Post transplant, yeah, but post transplant, yeah, yeah. yeah. post transplant, you know, a pre discharge or a peri discharge echo and an endomyocardial biopsy is done. Then, then there's probably one, and we have changed this policy over the years. Now, currently, probably after the second year, if the patient's heart is fine, he is absolutely well, you don't do biopsies. I'm talking about EMD first. Initially, the total number of endomyocardial biopsies after transplant was as much as about uh, six in two years. Now it has come down to three in two years. And is largely symptom driven, although he is under the care of the cardiologist. And for the first two years, he has echoes done every three months minimum the first year. The second year, providing he is well, it's about six months every year. And he's under the follow of the cardiologist. Uh, Particularly in echo, what we particularly see in these patients is one is the obviously ejection fraction and right and left ventricular ejection, uh, uh, EF. But more important thing is the thickness of the uh, ventricular wall. Uh, what is the diastolic dysfunction in this patient? Has this patient developed recent diastolic dysfunction? Whether there is increase in PA pressures or not, and IVC diameter and uh, respiratory variations. So these are the few things which gives you an idea of probably an early rejection. If there is an increase in diameter, uh, thickness of the ventricular wall, thickness of the uh, septum, or if there is an increase in the diastolic dysfunction, then they probably may have been having a subtle rejection. So this patient should be then subjected for EMB urgently, or if there is a uh, reduction in the ejection fraction also. So these are the few things which you normally see on your routine day-to-day -day echo of or heart transplantation patients. So, Rinder, is there a, actually a paradoxical myocarditis with immunosuppressive drugs? Sorry, I miss that. Is with immune check inhibitors. Yes. So I think what what Dr. Mohan is trying to say that uh, you, we can also get. Uh, some evidence of myocarditis because these patients are on immuno immunomodulation. I mean, they, they have immunosuppression, and also which also affects the right side more than the left side. So there are now reports that, that uh, a focus on the RV, uh, which can be subtly down immediately post transplant, also can can should also be looked at. So your thoughts. Practically not aware of uh, the myocarditis, immunosuppressive myocarditis. Dr. Bhagirath may be the person who can uh, give light on this. But definitely right ventricular assessment is very important. Most of the time what happens is that patients, routine cardiologists, they don't really focus on the right ventricle and the <clears throat> RV, SP and uh, PA pressures. This is very important in all heart transplantation patients because these are the earlier sign, earlier sign of uh, uh, rejection or earlier sign of RV failure in heart transplantation. So I think what Dr. Mohan was trying to tell is uh, the role of global strain uh, also comes in the follow-up. Uh, uh, I, I have not scanned much, but whatever I have read is uh, there are now 
uh, role of uh, strain coming in the LV and also on the RV. Dr. Mohan, your experience uh, on this? I, I, unfortunately, <laughs> cardiac transplantations are rare, rarely done in this part of the world where I practice. And I have absolutely no experience. I have I've done some few echoes, very, very few echoes of transplant patient, but I'm so sorry. I just don't have any. My question is, yeah. is it not on immune checkpoint inhibitors, mostly on cardio-oncology rather than the transplant? No, so yeah, 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 you're right. So the recommendations that have come up for, uh, for uh, this is Joe Splana's report on cardio-oncology, which has come up. It's but what, what, uh, yeah, but what, what, uh, uh, whatever the literature I have read is, that post transplant also immediate post transplant <clears throat> the rv is not functioning well but uh, uh, a follow up of the rv function and a sudden drop in global longitudinal strain uh, can also pick up uh, uh, acute rejection with also a change in the diastolic function with the uh, servers trying to tell so i think uh, i mean and we need more reading and maybe more uh, more literature to understand this i thought i, I needed to understand what is the follow up so i'm still trying to have uh, 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 um, more information about it. So that's why I took a, took this topic up. Yeah. I think we have, uh, thank you each and every one of you. It's been a wonderful session. I think we really had four fantastic lectures uh, uh, from Dr. Andrew Coates and Dr. Uday, uh, Dr. J.C. Mohan, an elegant lecture, and finally Dr. Sundar to tell us about what, what is happening in India and what the way to go about for heart transplant. I'm sure the audience would have had a really fantastic academic feast. Over to you, Santanu, to, uh, for your closing remarks. and finally. I think, Yeah, this has been a great uh, learning session. We learned a lot. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I hope the whole audience uh, experienced uh, a fantastic uh, discussion. And uh, uh, Dr. Chopra, uh, to end it, Dr. Uday. Uh, what's ne next? Next, uh, what is the next session? What are we planning? Fourteenth of April, fourteen next week, Wednesday, same time, seven to nine. Please log in. We'll send you details, emails, everyone. And uh, thank you very much, Vijay. I think it has been a fantastic session, and uh, I would like to thank all the participants, the panelists, and the speakers for wonderful presentations. And Dr. Sundar. Thank you for staying with us till the end. Thank okay. you. Good night. And you don't have competing webinars from HFI same day. Mohan, it happened we once. It doesn't want it. All right. Stay I, safe. I was, sh I was shuttling between the two webinars from here to there, there to here. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye.